cutting off encroachments, would individual rights and liberties be protected? And that, I think that structural argument is just uh, not appreciated today hardly at all. And there are very few members of Congress who, who speak that way and are willing. And when I say, in recent years, if I meet with Republican members, I know I can't talk much about the law of the Constitution. They just don't have an interest in it. But I tell them that if, uh, if you're, if the president is Republican uh, and you want to be partisan, go ahead and be partisan, but be partisan in a way that protects our system and protects you and protects your party, because if the president is about to go off a cliff, you just can't say in a nice partisan way, go ahead, you know. I, no, you have to say that's not going to be good for you, it's not going to be good for the country, that's not going to be good for the party, and you have to intervene in a partisan way to stop it and moderate it. But there are not enough members uh, willing, to, willing to do that. And the same Democrats now who are fighting against George W. Bush uh, didn't fight very hard when Bill Clinton was in office. And some of the Republicans who supported Reagan on his war powers uh, and Bush won uh, when Clinton got into office and he was very aggressive on using war powers. Uh, they sort of said nothing because they'd already blessed it under Reagan and Bush won, so they felt like they couldn't do anything under Clinton. So, um, no, it's a really uh, a poor trend of power heading toward the presidency with very little legislative check and actually very little uh, judicial check and very little public recognition. Go ahead, please. The Carter, the Carter years, yeah. <laughs> no, it's amazing. Uh, Washington, D.C. is supposed to be very sophisticated. It falls for every fad that comes along, and it's always won every three or four years, PPBS, ZBB, on and on and on and on. And it's amazing. It's like, oh, gee, this, uh, we never thought of this one. Let's go for this one. <laughs> and it goes on. It's just endless amount of tomfoolery on, on some kind of a concept. And most of it's, I don't know what, Steve, what you feel about the, the performance plan um, now. And uh, it's an awful lot of paperwork. And it, it's words uh, where the administration is supposed to show uh, what their plans are and how they meet those plans. But they use words that members of Congress and staff, they don't think that way. I forget, it's output, outgo, outlay, and so forth. I mean, we just don't think that way. And it's getting in the hands of technicians, and you can game it to death, because you can, you know, I, I can set for myself a goal next year of walking 12 feet. And, uh, you know, I walk 13 feet, and everyone says, how about you? You just, you just exceeded what you thought you could do. Well, I'll just give you a rousing applause. And that's what, and it's a huge amount of paperwork. And these, the legislative process and the appropriation process is political. It ought to be political. And once you head toward these technicians who can do all the paperwork and come up with concepts that hardly anybody can understand, uh, we're, in, we're in trouble. And uh, members should be making political judgment and not be embarrassed by it. But no, Z, ZBB lasted, I think, the four years of Carter and would continually be replaced by something else. Go ahead. Would you comment on the balanced budget amendment or the likelihood of one that will pass me and the times are Yeah, I've testified on that a couple of times. I think that was another misconception that states have balanced budgets, individuals and their families have balanced budgets, so the federal government should have a balanced budget. It's just a misconception. I mean, when I testified, uh, I, I conceded to the committee that I don't balance my budget. I, I didn't pay cash for my car. I didn't pay cash for the house. I have things called mortgages and so forth. And I, I, I am in debt, consumer debt, flying high, state debt. And you ask, how can states uh, not balance their budget? And the reason, of course, is that states don't have one budget. They've got one budget, the operating budget, which is in balance. And when they want to go into debt, they have a capital budget. And uh, the state constitution will say, well, you can use the capital budget to go in debt, but uh, a certain level, uh, guaranteed bonds. And people will hit that level and say, okay, we'll have non-guaranteed bonds. And so state debt goes up. And uh, that was one of the misconceptions. I think if Congress adopted a balanced budget amendment, it would play games like the states do. We have enough games now. We would have 
operating budget, balance it, and then you have a capital budget, and uh, just more confusion, more deception to the public, uh, more opportunities for playing games. Um, so, no, that, that model, the state model, states can do whatever they like, and they do it, but uh, to transfer that uh, to the federal government, I just think um, uh, less, less accountability and uh, more, more fooling of the public. So I will stop. Thanks very much. You've already been introduced to our next speaker, Professor Susan Hammond of American University, who is going to discuss the general welfare. Thank you, Mike. Um, I have to say I'm still somewhat uncertain about how to approach this topic. Uh, and uh, so what I'm going to do is take the usual professorial license, and uh, I'm going to expand the topic a bit. And I'm going to talk about promoting the general welfare, but both with regard to money legislation, which I'll basically define as budget and appropriations, and then with regard to more general non-money legislation. And I thought I might talk about some of the following things. Um, where ideas from leg for legislation come from, how agendas get set, that is legislative agendas, tensions between different philosophies of government, and how this works out in legislation. And I thought I'd try to raise some questions regarding the topic that I hope will be useful in perhaps shaping uh, approaches to uh, the topic in classroom conversations and also raise some questions which can be discussed. I think we might first ask, what is the general welfare? How should we define it? I'm not going to try to do that. I'm just going to ask the question and maybe give some examples later in different ways. Secondly, if promoting the general welfare is a goal of the national government, how can government do this? What programs or government actions can promote the general welfare? And it seems to me that answers to these questions really depend on philosophies of government and on the context within which government operates. So let me say a little bit about that. First, different philosophies of government. This is really the larger government versus smaller government controversy, it seems to me. And it's existed since the earliest days of our nation with the Hamiltonian and Jeffersonian differing views on national government. And I would argue that today it is evident, at least to a degree, in differences between the political parties. And it's also evident in differing policy proposals and actions taken by members of Congress and also taken by presidents. And probably also evident to some degree in different proposals and positions taken by presidential candidates, although differences, of course, uh, are sometimes highlighted and sometimes not, as uh, I think we're seeing in the current situation. Secondly, in considering this question, we need to consider how the context has changed. And as Joe Cooper noted and discussed so well on Monday, that, con is, that context is exceedingly important. The scope of government, of course, has expanded a lot over the years. And today, a wide range of government programs and activities are both accept accepted and expected. And indeed, different governmental philosophies or philosophies of government underlie proposals to cut back or to expand programs and areas of action. Throughout our history, there's been this kind of creative tension between these differing philosophies of government, I would argue. These are legitimate pr perspectives which, can be wove, which are woven into our democracy and raise questions such as, should government use the Treasury to support general initiatives? How far should government go in spending dollars to promote the general welfare? What about the Louisiana Purchase today? 
comparable expenditure? A, what about a comparable, an expenditure comparable to it? What about the development of in, infrastructure in Henry Clay's American system? What about medical research monies today? More scientific, more theoretical scientific research. They, these are major questions which I am not going to try to answer, but which do in fact uh, get raised when one thinks about monies or legislation, monies, and the public welfare, it seems to me. Uh, now, as I was saying the other day, Congress represents diverse groups in the nation, and therefore often very different perspectives uh, are evident from these different groups. It's also, Congress is also an arena for managing partisan, geographic, and other differences that come into conflict. And if you look at the structure of Congress, and Lou Fisher has talked about this already in terms of uh, the um, appropriations part process, committees and even smaller groups, subcommittees, play a major role in how this conflict of differing perspectives and different policy points of views uh, are handled. The, uh, I think the other major factor or way it's handled is the often lengthy legislative process of considering a pr proposed legislation. And that's very, I think that's not really well understood at all. In fact, the, the, uh, uh, when the public opinion polls show that this is one of the things that disgusts citizens, that things go on for so long and people talk and talk and talk and there doesn't seem to be any final outcome. But it certainly does help handle and manage uh, the different perspectives, the different conflicts, let people view their differences, and then ultimately, usually, or in many instances, come to some kind of final conclusion, often a compromise. So I'd argue that both organization and structure of Congress provides for different views on programs and legislation to be aired, to be discussed, to be thrashed out, and perhaps to re reach compromises acceptable at least to a majority of members, and that this is critical to considering and promoting the general welfare. I thought I'd talk very briefly about Congress setting agenda, how Congress sets agendas, where ideas from legislation come from, and then talk a little bit about some of the bills that are in the current Congress and how all of this might apply in some ways. Okay, how does Congress set agendas? Well, much of the congressional agenda uh, is actually uh, already set or are required, and it re those particularly re relate to two aspects of it. One are the money bills. Uh, a budget resolution is generally passed each year, setting out major priorities for the country. That's not yet been passed, unless it happened in the last few days. It's been passed, they have to be passed by both houses. It does not have to be signed by the president. It is a congressional document. And then appropriations bills of some sort need to be passed every year in order to run the federal government, unless there's already an appropriation that is a three-year appropriation for a program. So those are really already on the agenda. And a third kind of legislation that's often on, that is, is put on an agenda is reauthorizing legislation to continue programs that will otherwise end, but that Congress wants to consider. Unless you reauthorize, there are ways around this, but they're not usually used. Unless you, uh, unless, if you want to reauthorize the program, you really need to put that on the agenda and you need to pass a bill to reauthorize it. So these are sort of must do agenda items. After that, proposals come from various places. The president is, of course, very important here, and he's got very formal ways he proposes congressional agendas as well as informal ways. He gives a State of the Union address, he sends up budget proposals, he sends up various messages to Congress about items and about issues, and he develops legislation or he has developed legislation in the White House or the executive branch which is then sent to Congress and introduced by a member. A president cannot actually introduce a bill into Congress. Uh, and uh, like oversight, which was very ably discussed earlier in this conference, there's a lot of informal discussion that goes on between the president, the White House staff, the executive agencies, and members and staff in Congress about programs, policies, and legislation. So that's kind of one general way. And presidents are important in setting the congressional agenda, and all presidents these days seek to affect congressional priorities and legislation. Some are more successful than others in doing this. 
A new president, particularly, particularly if of a different party, will propose and support new policies. The shift from Carter to Reagan or from Clinton to Bush, too, are certainly examples of this. Over a presidential term or terms, two factors may affect presidential proposals to Congress. Presidents gain increasing experience, and you can kind of graph it, <laughs> increasing experience in proposing and supporting legislation and how to get legislation they support through. But they also have decreasing influence, so you have kind of two lines meeting. Uh, and that's really because th they approach the end of their term or terms. And so they've got fewer things that they can use to persuade members that their position is correct. In addition, what might be called presidential style is important. And uh, here I re refer to a presidential list of priorities which gets sent to Congress. President Carter, for example, sent a long list of proposed legislation to Congress. And when asked by Congress, perhaps it was Tip O'Neill, or at any rate, one of the leaders, to list his most important priorities, he said they were all important. Congress did eventually act on some of them, but Carter spent a lot of time, energy, and political capital on his many agenda requests. And this would not have been necessary if he'd focused on a more national set or number of, of what he considered his top priorities. In contrast, President Reagan, his first year in office, presented and focused on a limited number of agenda items, most of them related to what we call Reaganomics, taxing and spending cuts, uh, and appealed to the public for support, as, and was a great communicator. He told the public to write your congressman and, get, and tell, them you, tell him you, or her you support these. And he had a major effect on the congressional agenda. Overall questions we might ask uh, about agenda setting and subsequent action on legislation with regard to the presidential role are, uh, what's the role of the president? What's the role of Congress? What's appropriate for each, ba uh, for each branch? Joe Cooper on Monday uh, last pointed to congressional dominance in the late 19th century, and a, but a shift to presidential dominance today. This means that the president now plays a far more active role affecting and even establishing a congressional agenda and in working for passage of bills uh, than was the case in earlier eras. So the president has a lot to do with setting the agenda or at least trying to set the congressional agenda. Secondly, members of Congress, of course, are very important in setting the, the congressional agenda. All members can introduce bills, and in this way, they put issues on the agenda. They may not be handled further, but they get on the agenda. A formal position of committee chair or committee ranking minority member matters. Those bills, and especially on important issues, are likely to move to the committee agenda, really move on to a committee agenda, and Get, and the committee may actually work on that bill and, uh, and consider it and, uh, and approve it. Seniority also helps, especially in the House, less important in the Senate. Constituents can be important in suggesting ideas for uh, bills and or if in bringing attention, uh, the attention of members to problems that may exist in districts out of which a bill may come. And sometimes staff are important in agenda setting. Crises matter and lead to legislation. Think about 9-11, for instance, um, and ongoing terrorism issues. And for problems and issues which may have been around a while, there often appears what political scientists call a window of opportunity. When uh, you get coming together a problem, you know there's a problem out there, there's also a possible solution that's been kind of wandering around for a while, and a favorable context for bringing those two together and getting Congress to focus on the issue and then to do something about it. And I'd argue that welfare reform under Clinton is an example of this, perhaps, where there was clearly a problem that had been out there for a long time. There were a whole wide range of possible solutions. It became clear that people were ready to work on it, and they in fact ended up with a welfare reform bill. So overall questions that we might ask about agenda setting and subsequent action on legislation are, uh, 
are, uh, as I've indicated, what are the different roles of the different people? Where do ideas for legislation come from? I've already sort of touched on this. A brief answer is from everywhere. Constituents, constituency needs, national needs, crises, members, congressional staff, and of course the president and executive branch agencies. Any number of bills can be introduced, but a limited number, as you know, are actually on the active congressional agenda. And that is a limited number moved to committee consideration and approval, and still fewer become law. And of those that are worked on and do become law, members of Congress and the American public may differ as to which promote the general welfare uh, and which may have a far more limited impact. Let me turn just very briefly now to some of the issues of the present Congress. And first, let me say a little bit about appropriations bills um, and uh, the focus on money and the general welfare. Here, as on other types of bills, the underlying questions, what is the general welfare and what promotes it, are important. And here also, different perspectives of the role of government are evident, and I would argue uh, there can be different conclusions regarding whether or not certain monies promote the general welfare, uh, especially perhaps if certain provisions appropriate monies for only a very limited constituency. We might agree that appropriations bills overall promote the general welfare. Appropriations for defense, for example, promote the general welfare. If, however, we look at the specific provisions uh, and details of some of these bills, we might agree that some provisions quite clearly promote the general welfare, money for the armed forces, for example. But other provisions may be much more localized and parochial, as, as you all may know, spe specific earmarks, for example, so-called, uh, can be put into pro appropriations bills uh, and specify funding at the request of members of Congress for projects, buildings, bridges, dams, support for institutions within a congressional district or state. Certainly these benefit constituencies and perhaps the general welfare of that district or state but do they also benefit the general welfare of the nation? And this comes back to we need to kind of think about what we mean by the general welfare. Um, should promoting the general welfare of the nation be the test of promoting the general welfare? I'm not so sure. Uh, money bills, however, appropriations and tax bills are a small percentage of the bills examined by Congress. If we consider legislation that affects the general welfare, I think we need to consider bills on a wide range of topics, things like education, housing programs, job training for the unemployed, foreign policy bills, defense buildup or cutback, uh, and many of the non-appropriations bills uh, authorize that appropriations be made but don't actually make appropriations or increase or decrease govern government revenues through tax bills bills, but they are based on views of what at the national level will promote the, na the general welfare. And I'll talk, uh, in, the, in the 107th and the current 108th Congress, many issues have been addressed. Terrorism, homeland security, Iraq, Afghanistan, no child left behind, Medicare prescription drug benefits. The, and I'm going to take just a moment to talk about some bills that were listed as bills to watch in the June 5th. 2004 issue of Congressional Quarterly Weekly and give you some sense of how many of these there were. Uh, appropriations bills are excluded. Of the 17 bills listed, one was the budget resolution, one, a money bill, was the budget resolution uh, conference report, which I think has not yet been approved. Of the remaining bills, four reauthorized existing programs, Head Start, Welfare, national security programs of the Department of Energy and Highway and Mass Transit. The DOD uh, bill also includes some new, authoriz new authorization for expenditures for military operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Arguably, I, I would say, these promote the general welfare. Then I would say that also some provisions of at least three of these, I exclude Head Start, because I think this, are, are controversial. I think Head Start is probably not so controversial. Uh, and some aspects of these bills I've just listed could be, depending on one's view, as not really promoting the general welfare in the way that the person thinking about it might want. 
Three of the bills are tax bills. Three are described as overhaul of existing policy, two in narrow areas. Uh, the remaining six range from asbestos pl claims compensation, a specific and presumably narrow constituency, to FDA regulation of tobacco, which is, and therefore cigarettes, which is a major issue, and DNA testing, uh, expansion of testing. Compared to the Louisiana purchase in support of infrastructure for a fairly new uh, nation, these bills perhaps seem more narrowly focused, and yet each that affects a fairly narrow constituency also may indirectly affect the entire polity. Others more directly affect all Americans. Do they affect the general welfare? Many, but perhaps not all do. And it really depends on your definition, I think. So I come back to my initial points about Congress, money, and the general welfare. A basic tension about the role of government continues to exist, the Hamiltonian versus the Jeffersonian view. Bigger government, or put another way, an expanded scope of government versus a smaller role of government. And this exists not only for the broader picture, but also uh, in uh, the specific provisions of a bill. So a creative tension evident from the early years of the US as a nation continues today. But we do have the mechanisms in place to handle those tensions through the Congress, although increased partisanship in Congress, sometimes this doesn't seem too evident. But it seems to me that in respecting these tensions, looking at the different perspectives, having a process by which we discuss these things, the way Congress is organized, the procedures that we have, handles these differences and these tensions and helps develop policy and can, in fact, lead to very useful outcomes. I'm going to stop there. And I think no time for questions. <laughs> Thank you. We'll defer questions until after the next speaker and just see how much time we have remaining. We started late and I want to try to get us back on the original schedule. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Lawrence F. O'Brien III. You may have seen the conclusion of the NBA uh, championship game last night and the awarding of the uh, O'Brien Trophy named after Larry's father, former NBA commissioner, uh, the campaign strategist for President Kennedy, President Johnson, uh, the architect of the modern Congressional Relations Office in the White House. And uh, it was through Larry O'Brien that I got, had the opportunity to know uh, his son, Larry O'Brien III, uh, one of the premier lawyers and lobbyists in, in Washington. And uh, he was also the founder of the Foundation for the National Archives. So I had the opportunity officially to have lunch with uh, Larry about once a week. And uh, I always came away from those lunches feeling that I had learned far more about the way Congress really operated than I did from reading the papers or watching the televisions. And uh, it's, uh, it's a rare treat to be able to share those insights and the expertise uh, with you today. Larry is a, is a graduate of Harvard College and uh, Columbia Law School. He's a decorated uh, veteran of Vietnam uh, and, a, uh, as I say, a, a leading uh, lobbyist in, uh, in Washington on uh, uh, tax policy, uh, working with the tax writing committees, the Ways and Means Committee in the House and the Finance Committee in the Senate. And uh, so, Larry, it's yours. Great to have you here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank Mike for inviting me. I'm not sure how much wisdom I have to impart, but it's been some years since I've been in the building. Uh, uh, Mike uh, actually harvested uh, my father's uh, oral history for the Johnson Library, a uh, project that took uh, a number of of years and uh, required him to be intensely involved with my family in a variety of settings and uh, those records actually are housed here at now and uh, are accessed by uh, historians and scholars with some frequency so 
I feel a little bit at home. We're very close to the Johnson family and remain close to them. So it's a pleasure to be here. When Mike first contacted me about this, he said, I want you to think about coming down and talk about Congress and money. And uh, my, my first instinct was that he wanted me to talk about fundraising. Uh, something I actually know a fair amount about anyone in my line of work uh, is really required to uh, have a fair degree of working knowledge about that. That's a, that's a rather mundane subject, and I think uh, one probably not appropriate to uh, try to uh, uh, convey to high school students. Uh, they'll have time enough to learn about that sort of thing. So, and Mike said I, maybe I could focus a little bit on tax policy, uh, which is something my, in my work history I've been involved with quite a bit. My firm uh, is involved with to this day. And by the way, Professor Hammond, we're extensively involved in that asbestos uh, legislation reform uh, bill. I'd be happy to talk to you about that. But, and we do believe it's in the general interest of the American people. But um, that I, maybe I could confine myself to tax which is a difficult subject, substantively, certainly. It's uh, highly arcane in some, in some level of detail. But uh, maybe at least uh, 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 try to convey some sense of the legislative and political dynamics that are uh, often not always associated with the processing uh, tax legislation uh, in the Congress, and, and try to offer that from the perspective of a, an outsider, frankly, a paid agent. Uh, uh, in many instances, uh, representing uh, specific, fairly specific types of, you know, of interest or an array of them, a multiplicity of them. So, uh, in thinking about it, I actually decided to go back in history a little bit, and I can come forward to the current time. There may be some interesting contrast there if, there's, if time permits. But the one exercise that I, I, I think sort of uh, contains within it a variety of lessons uh, about the politics uh, of. Uh, uh, of Congress and the politics of tax legislation in the Congress is really the 1986 Tax Reform Act as it came to be signed into law by Ronald Reagan ultimately. Um, and I think, uh, let me set a context there and, and try to offer a few observations about the work that occurred on that. I think they may be somewhat illuminating or instructive and I think have some persisting kind of value. Ronald Reagan reelected in 1984 for a second term uh, fairly promptly in the spring of 1985 through his Treasury Department promulgated a master blueprint for tax reform, about a 175-page document, fairly dense, written in English, uh, uh, which uh, really was rather an astonishing product in many ways. And, and at its core, uh, what this uh, offering, not legislation, it wasn't drafted as legislation, but what this offering uh, was to the tax population, the lobbying population in Washington, economists, uh, was a suggestion as to how uh, tax rates, which were very sensitive, a very sensitive issue to President Reagan personally, something that came up subsequently a number of times in meetings we had with him as this project unfolded, but uh, how uh, tax rates could be dramatically reduced, both corporate and individual, for him mostly on the individual side, but also for corporations, uh, to reduce those marginal tax rates uh, without increasing uh, uh, the federal budget deficit. By this point in his career in Washington, he was somewhat sensitized to the red ink phenomenon, uh, having started in 1981 with a, an enormous, it may even be the singularly, the still la uh, single largest tax cut ever adopted by the Congress, a uh, bill that uh, generated enormous fiscal damage, which he came to recognize ultimately and sort of repaired uh, quietly, but effectively over the next two or three years of his first term. He offered this on a revenue neutral suggested it on a revenue neutral basis. That is, if we can broaden the base of the tax system by eliminating certain deductions, specialized deductions, special tax credits, special accounting rules that had migrated into the tax code since 1954, 30 years previously, the last time it was fundamentally uh, reviewed and revised, we could generate, in effect, a revenue source, a pot of money that could be reinvested in reducing these tax rates. That is, I want to have a bill, if one can be done, that neither is a, in the aggregate, a tax increase, obviously as a Republican he wouldn't, wouldn't be comfortable with that anyway, or a tax decrease. But I do want to fundamentally revise the tax system so that it's a bit simpler, fairer amongst and between taxpayers who are similarly situated, and which in the end contains a far lower set of marginal income tax rates on people's uh, income. Now this was set against a congressional, uh, in a congressional context that consisted of the Republicans at that point controlling the Senate, 
I think by about five votes, maybe six. And the House of Representatives, still in the hands of the Democrats, uh, and by a very significant margin. They had a 71 seat majority in 1986. They had 253 seats, uh, and uh, Republicans had 182. So the question then became after this architecture and this actually well drafted, well presented, uh, well conceived, and uh, uh, reflected an awful lot of thought actually. After this was uh, put forward into the public domain, how would you possibly shape this into a legislative exercise? The Constitution contains the requirement that revenue measures be initiated in the House of Representatives. Although the Senate occasionally tries to play games with that procedurally, those games are played at the margin. Actually, it's kind of fun and sometimes it has a value. But in, in this instance, with something of this magnitude, there was no way that, that the Republican Senate was going to initiate a review of this particular type of proposal and an effort to shape it into legislation, it would have to start in the House. The House was strongly, post the 1984 elections, was strongly in the hands of the Democrats. They had just gone through an election cycle and they had a 71 seat majority. So why should the Democrats really give a damn, you know, about this? Uh, it wasn't proposed as legislation. It was offered as this mega work suggestion, blueprint. Uh, what would cause the House to uh, initiate a serious minded effort to try to shape and effectuate this into a piece of actual legislation? Good question. Many of us at that point uh, were asking ourselves the same thing. And actually, in the end, it turned on two perceptions that people developed each piece of which I happen to be myself involved in because of my own history in the Carter administration and in the Office of Tax Policy. Some businesses on analysis of the product decided that they would be net winners, net winners in terms of their tax liabilities and burdens in reference to then current law. That when all these, uh, when you looked at all of these special provisions and tax accounting rules and what have you, and if you assume their elimination or radical revision, some businesses concluded they would be better off in exchange for a rate reduction of some dimension. And you can actually measure these in dollars. Inclined to be supportive, inclined to think maybe this is worth trying. A bunch of other businesses looked at it, industry sectors, and said, oh my God, this is a disaster. Absolute catastrophe. We would be huge losers if anything like this were to ever occur. And they were people like the, uh, oil and gas industry, chemical manufacturers, pharmaceutical manufacturers, um, did clinical analysis of this and said, geez, we, we, can't, we, can't, we have to stop this, that we can't have the Congress take this seriously. So in order to get the, the Democrats, the House Democrats, to really look at this, one of the two things that had to happen was there had to be put in evidence a serious enough level of support organized within the Washington context of the Washington community, support for the thrust of Reagan's proposal within the business community to suggest to the Democrats that this would not be universally opposed by organized, well-financed, which they tend to be, business interests in Washington. There had to be breakage, in effect, civil war within the business sector uh, uh, in Washington. Some of us had clients who were prepared to actually entertain that. Uh, and over a process of uh, two months, we kind of found each other. Uh, some of these companies came together. Some trade associations then came together and formed an, an organization called TRAC, the Tax Reform Action Coalition. Uh, books have been written about it and went, went on to greater glory, but that was the, the organization, the umbrella group that ultimately came, came forward, emotionally committed, intellectually committed, and prepared to invest financially in an effort to advance the Reagan blueprint over the objections of fellow members of the business community. Um, the lead elements in track actually was suggestive. What we tried to do was make sure that they were collective, collected enough and disparate enough in business line that it conveyed a sense that there was a broad base in the business community that did support this, this effort. A bit of a con but, but, it, but it, it was a design issue. We had to have enough difference in business composition in it to s sort of effectively convey that prospect. Two companies in particular who joined track uh, 
I think were, 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 were most dramatic uh, contributors to that, uh, to that notion. One was IBM and one was General Motors, each for their own reasons. Uh, which probably not worth going through here, uh, uh, there's not enough time for that, decided that they would visibly, vocally, and financially lend themselves to a group effort to push this Reagan proposal forward over the vociferous, almost venomous objections of numerous other uh, interests in the business community. The second thing that we had to put in evidence, and, and, I, and I, I don't make this secondary at all, uh, was uh, to, uh, to bring forward to the Democratic leadership of the House, principally Chairman Rostenkowski, who at that point, Dan Rostenkowski was the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, and Speaker O'Neill, as the leader of the House Democrats, that this proposal was worth entertaining, uh, was worth it politically, that it would not explode in the face of the Democrats if they, if they, if they pursued it vigorously, that it was worth it intellectually, as a matter of design, system design, tax policy. If anything approaching what Reagan had proposed could in fact be accomplished, the tax system, the income tax system at least, the income tax portion of it, would be a fundamentally improved, better income tax system than the one that was in place at that point. And a number of scholars, starting with the lead elements from the Carter administration, the Office of Tax Policy, where I worked, came to that conclusion upon construing this 175-page document. In fact, as it turned out, they had written portions of it and left it in the files at the Treasury. Um, through them and the network uh, that, uh, uh, consisting of them and out through them, we assembled former IRS commissioners, tax economists, law professors, uh, tax lawyers, and what have you, into a group, many of them Democrats, known Democrats, with Democratic large D bona fides, and by letter and in person took them up to the House, principally to see Chairman Rostenkowski and Speaker O'Neill, but also somewhat more generally in terms of members of the Ways and Means Committee, and told them, offered them the assurance that this proposal had merit, even though President Reagan had been the person who had advanced it, uh, that this proposal had merit, it was worth trying to pursue, it would be extraordinarily difficult politically to accomplish, there would be a lot of blood flowing in the streets from this, be a lot of pushback, but it, if it could be advanced, it was worth it. And they concluded to try it. Uh, Chairman Rostenkowski in particular was a very powerful guy at that point. Said, okay, let's give it a whirl. And from there, we went into a virtual six to seven month effort to assemble a piece of legislation in the House, in the Ways and Means Committee, that would at least be an honest reflection of where Reagan started. It would not be identical. There was no way that could happen. Uh, but at least an honest thematic reflection of what had been proposed. And this track coalition was, was exceptionally active in lobbying specific members to that end in the House and in generating macro media, by which I mean op-ed pieces, newspapers all over the country, editorial board presentations from various track coalition members CEOs of these companies, going out into the field, articulating a case for this exercise, all of which proved to be absolutely and totally necessary because there was a very organized, well-financed, highly aggressive, you know, counterattack on this whole, whole exercise, mostly from segments of the business community, other segments of the business community. So in December uh, of 1985, having started in the spring of 85, a product having been reported out of the Ways and Means Committee, after a huge struggle and a prolonged, uh, a prolonged markup process, Bill went to the floor, December 11th, 1985. Some of us were out having some beers, uh, celebrating the uh, fact that this way station had been reached. Um, lesson number two, and one I never forgot, the Rules Committee in the House, unlike the Senate, an extraordinarily important way station in the legislative process. They actually uh, report legislation out of rules under terms and conditions for debate on the floor. Uh, whether amendments can be offered, how many of what kind, how long will debate occur, how will the time be divided, etc. So that rule has to be adopted before you can get to the core legislation around which it's wrapped. Rules out on the floor being debated 
everybody, and I mean everybody, assumed that the vote on the rule would be routine and the underlying bill, the tax reform bill reported from Ways and Means, would be reached. Train wreck. The rules voted down, 223 to 202. Uh, of, all, of the Republicans in the House, now this started as a sort of a Reagan initiative. Of the Republicans in the House, of the 182 Republicans then in the House, 166 of them voted against the rule. Something uh, slightly in excess of 90 percent. There were 57 Democrats uh, who also voted against the rule for a variety of reasons. The steel companies were adamantly opposed to the legislation, and so they got certain steel state Democrats agitated. There was a whole litany of things that occurred, all of which are very understandable. Uh, but the assumption that was being very comfortably made all around that this, uh, this bill was on its way after a huge struggle uh, collapsed. Um, and that could have been the end of it actually, and the people who were vehemently opposed to the bill certainly encouraged the notion that that should be the end of it. Um, Speaker O'Neill, under some prodding from a variety of people, took it up with President Reagan directly and personally as to whether this should go to a second round in terms of trying to uh, adopt a rule on the floor and proceed a debate on the core bill. Uh, and after that sort of dialogue uh, uh, ensued, a conclusion was reached that a second effort would be made if and only if the House Republicans would produce a minimum of 60 votes, roughly one-third of their caucus, in support of the rule on the second round. And that President Reagan was to personally involve himself in that effort to produce those Republicans, and that the Speaker wanted to see a certified list before the vote was taken, or he would not call this up again. It took 10 days of feverish work. This track coalition that I mentioned uh, exten extensively involved in this vote hunt for these 60 Republican votes. It was not easy. Uh, Trent Lott, who was at that point the, uh, the whip, the House Republican whip, you know, had been instrumental in engineering the ambush on the rule the first time, remained opposed to the legislation. Um, and it, it uh, was not as easy as you would have thought, actually. Uh, but in the end, Long story short, the Republicans produced 58 votes, not 60. The Speaker relented and said, I'll give you the two. Uh, called up the bill. The rule was adopted fairly, uh, you know, fairly healthily. The bill went on to be debated and adopted. Then it went to the Senate. I'm, I'm sort of going to stop for a minute. But the, the, one, the, the one thing I would point out about the loss of this rules vote, and again, it's sort of central. It's, these are sort of the calculations you get into in my world. So although, it, although the damage was repaired, it wasn't entirely repaired because that initial vote in the House on the rule sent a signal to the Senate Republicans who were in the majority in the Senate that all was not well with this legislation, particularly amongst the Republican brethren, uh, and that, uh, uh, that uh, there might be a lot to think about here in terms of what, if anything, the Senate ultimately would do in response to this legislative initiative. And I won't bore you with what happened there. That's a whole other set of, of vagaries and, and complications. It was a hugely difficult thing to ultimately uh, process through the Senate. Bill Bradley was very helpful there. Bob Dole actually was very helpful as well. And ultimately Chairman Packwood. But the, 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 the procedural, just the mere procedure of this, of this, of this rules vote, was, it was so instructive and is talked about actually in my world, is talked about to this day and joked about as an intense object lesson about how uh, procedure can sometimes confound the best of intentions. Uh, bill was ultimately signed in 1986, took uh, 17 months. Uh, big Rose Garden ceremony, all the track people were there. We all got pictures taken with President Reagan. We all got personal letters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I guess from our point of view, it had a happy ending. But I thought I, would, I, I, thought I would just share that with you. It's a, that was the last great, frankly, that was the last great in some ways, the last great legislative exercise period in terms of its complications and, 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 and political dynamics, but certainly in the tax, on the tax front, it was, there hasn't been anything seen, like it seen, you know, since and really even previously. Now, coming forward just briefly, you have nothing like that going on. What you have now uh, are Republicans in control of all the levers of government uh, 
in Washington, the executive branch, and the two houses of Congress. It's a core thesis, a central political thesis of the Republican Party to cut taxes. That's just a mantra. That's both an economic and political philosophy. It's not really a tax kind of policy philosophy. So as a result, what we've been having in the last few years are just tax cut bills. Uh, they're not intellectually demanding. And even they're not even politically complicated, quite frankly. That's like taking candy from a baby in my world. If you turn a green light on to cut taxes, uh, your only problem there is how, how big the tax cut's going to turn out to be, not that you're going to get one through the Congress. Uh, and in fact, they have a bill pending now that you may have read about. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a little narrow in scope, but this Foreign Sales Corporation bill, which I think really is an example of what can happen when there are no governors in the process and you're cutting taxes. If there's no budget discipline, if there's no budget architecture, kind of constraining or controlling how the degree to which you can cut taxes, and if there's no lever of power in either branch of the Congress, sort of suggesting that fiscal prudence and discipline really might, might be necessary, the process tends to run riot. Uh, and it's driven, that riot in part is fueled and driven by paid people like me and the people we represent who are, are crashing through an open door. And they say, hey, look, you want to cut taxes? Cut mine. That's fine. I've got three or four things I'd like you to do, and I don't see why you'd say no. And what's happening is, in this bill, this particular bill really stands for this proposition. It should have, it's designed to fix a problem we have with the World Trade Organization, not to, to, and, it's, it's a, and it's a legitimate problem, and, and it needs to be, it calls for the repeal of a certain corporate tax provision that's highly beneficial with some companies. And, you know, the, the estimated revenue cost is something like, over multiple period of years, is something like $50 billion, $30 billion, somewhere in there, uh, of what repealing this would actually generate to the Treasury if you didn't turn around and spend it on something else. So the, the legislation designed to cure this WTO uh, uh, problem has turned into a $160 billion tax reduction bill. Uh, and the reason for it purely and simply is there's no governors on the, on, the, on the political process. The administration has chosen not for whatever variety of reasons, not to assert itself in the name of constraint in the shaping of the legislation, and the congresspersons, whose natural instinct is to just kind of go, 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 pushed by private sector interests who want them to go, 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 have, have taken this bill and turned it into what one editorial piece called a complete lard bucket. <laughs> and a disgrace. Now, I'm not sure I'd go that far because we have some clients with some considerable interest in the bill. <laughs> but, and I guess part of me would like to see it adopted, so I don't want to go too far there, but it does stand as an example, and it's somewhat degree in, in contrast to what happened with the, with the tax reform bill in 86. So um, I think, Mike, I guess I would stop there. Uh, we can take one or two questions. Do you think? Yeah, okay. Anybody have any questions? I mean, this, is, this, is, this wasn't the R-rated version. Uh, <laughs> so, yes? Yeah. Uh, and this is right. Shipbuilding. Miss Mississippi, that's which, which explains Trent Lott's attack on the bill. Uh, uh, the shipbuilders, and to this day, actually have some. The shipbuilders had some rather peculiar and generous tax-based federal subsidies to help shore them up. American shipbuilders. Uh, <laughs> we get some foreigners get in there too. So. Um, so they, 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 were, they were certainly there, uh, the, uh, the oil and gas industry, in part because this would have closed down oil and gas shelters that were being marketed on the individual side, were being marketed aggressively as a way for relatively affluent people or wealthy people to reduce uh, their tax exposure and their, and their marginal tax rates. Uh, this was a huge capital resource for, for the oil and gas industry, and that, that was going to be closed entirely, and ultimately was, at courtesy of legislation. So they weren't, they weren't too happy about it. Commercial real estate developers, uh, who enjoyed at that point awesome accelerated depreciation allowances on office buildings and things, uh, which Congress, frankly, periodically over a period of years had made richer and richer and deeper and deeper, and to the point where you were having office buildings, as Lloyd Benson, who was then in the, in the system in Congress, you know, call it these, these, these see-through office buildings in Dallas, Texas, which literally were being built as tax shelters, had no tenants in them. But the tax code at that time perversely and somewhat ironically uh, uh, could be manipulated to create an economic justification to build those buildings and sell them, sell interest in them to people looking for tax shelter. Uh, 
Uh, didn't make a lot of sense. Frankly, it was hard to defend. And I, in the end, I think that's why the bill ultimately, despite its, the, the potholes and microbursts that drove it down occasion, the bill ultimately prevailed in, in large measure because I think once, once the horse got on the track, once it was debated in the open, once certainly once it got through the House despite the collapse on the rules vote, it was hard for the opposition, clearly and in the open, to say, Jesus, this is terrible. This doesn't make any sense. You've got to stop this. The Congress can't. You can't go forward with this. The, the, the public aspects of the debate were very difficult for them to manage, linguistically even. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't engage in a, in a four-square debate about this and, and, and honestly take the other side in many cases. So what they had to do was use the interstices of the legislative process, their political allies in the Congress, their campaign contribution streams and whatnot, and see if they couldn't actually gear jam it somewhere along the way. I think operating realistically on, on the perception that the further this got into the legislative process, the more difficult it would be to stop because the media and the press aspects would begin to uh, kick in and, 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 and start to create some momentum for it, give it some drive. And we did succeed in getting a, a pretty extensive degree of editorial opinion ultimately written to the effect that this made a lot of sense, long time coming, time to close down some of these egregious tax shelters you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that made it increasingly difficult for the people opposed to the bill to actually stop it, and certainly to do it in an open forum. Uh, and, and, ulti and, and, and in the end, they were, they were not able to, but it was certainly not for lack of effort. And President Reagan threw it all. Don't bother me with the details. I will just say that, and I say it somewhat finally, and I don't mean it because he just died. The guy could tell a joke, I, I, I tell you. And we were in a bunch of meetings with him, and, and he would come in and, and about this, good times and in bad, when it was going well and it wasn't, he'd come in, give you a little pep talk, tell a funny story, keep up the good work. You know, you guys are, I'm with you, you're doing great. They'd take him out, he'd go off, and then, you know, you'd talk, sort of talk, talk some business and stuff, but through it all, just get me the lowest rates you can. He didn't want to hear about any, any detail. He didn't want to hear about how you get there, who was getting hammered. Who is going to lose a tax break or a tax benefit to create some of the revenue you need to lower these tax rates? Didn't want to hear about any of it. I mean, it was quite amazing. He left it to the Treasury Department, who was at that point led by Texas's own Jim Baker. Did a, f a fabulous job, a absolutely masterful political job in steering this legislation through the Congress. Well, it's, really, it's kind of what Lou said. I, I don't dismiss it as faddish. I mean, they're constantly looking for the silver bullet. I, I'm afraid what's, what's the problem you have now is we're disconnected. They're, they're really, intellectually, I think in the academic community, there, there's no longer a, uh, a commonly accepted tax paradigm as to what the tax system should look like. And this creates some enormous problems, believe me, and it goes to your question, because there's a school of thought, and it comes out of, and, and these, are, these are very able scholars. It comes very aggressively out of places like the Heritage Foundation and the Cato Institute that say we ought to junk the income tax altogether. Get rid of it and replace it with a sales tax, consumption-based tax, value-added tax. Just take it, throw it in the trash heap, and let's start all over again. And these people are not kooks. I mean, they're, 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 there's a lot of literature about this. It, it has a fair amount of traction within kind of Republican-based philosophical and academic circles. So you now have this, ooh, do, you, do you continue to sort of entertain the notion that you can perfect the income tax system? And some people would define like a 10% flat rate. You might say, well, that'd be a huge, huge thing. Do you want to even try to drive the thought process in that direction, or you want to say, oh, to hell with that. We're not even going to bother with that anymore. Let's just, let's just figure out how, how we replace it with a, with a sales tax. Well, these are enormous, enormous political and economic, you know, questions. And if there's no consensus, if there's no intellectual consensus, and there really isn't now, as to where to go or what's the right way to, to, to look at this, then all you get is confusion, and you get people pulling in all kinds of different directions. And I think that's clearly the, at the moment, that's clearly the situation. So I, would not, I wouldn't be at all encouraging on that. Yeah. President Bush says if he gets a second term, is, is he, he would like to, you know, go back to the Social Security issue. He doesn't seem to have tax system design, redesign, and terribly much in mind at this juncture. He says he wants to go back and see if, you know, something fundamental can't be done to Social Security. So, which would be a 
unbelievable exercise. Yeah, John. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no question. No question. A lot of people were client conflicted. Uh, a lot of resources, assets, lobbying assets in Washington found themselves client confl conflicted or had to, make, had to make decisions about being on one side or the other and had to terminate clients and things. You know, those are very difficult judgments to make. In my case, it was, it was serendipity. Uh, back at that point, in terms of my practice in 1986, it was a clear shot. We had three, in terms of my business at that point, we had three very significant clients, very significant businesses, uh, who different kinds of businesses actually, who looked at this in part, under, in part under our tutelage, analyzed the proposal, looked at it and said, hey, let's go for it. So that freed us up, freed my crew up, freed me up to, to say, okay, let's go help put this coalition together. You guys join this track thing. I go back to some of these Carter administration you know, big thinkers or buddies of mine uh, who I know are sort of positively inclined towards this anyway. We'll see if we can't assemble them, uh, build that out, create a bigger pool of intellectual support for this, take that up to the Hill to the House Democrats and try to persuade them that this is really going to, this would really be worth the pain and suffering that I think everybody understood would be attendant to it. There were, I don't think there were any illusions about really how difficult a legislative project it would be. Uh, and they decided to do it. So, but yeah, well, there was a lot of conflict situations. Created some nasty issues. Yeah. Okay, Mike? Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Again, pleased to be here. We've got just a few minutes before we go into our workshop on the tariff of abominations. If any of you uh, need to stretch your legs, you may, but I'd like to ask uh, Susan Hammond and Lou Fisher to come back up and join Larry O'Brien so that the three of them can field any questions that you have on, uh, on Congress and money. And uh, so, uh, Susan, if, if you and Lou will, uh, will join Larry at the, at the table and uh, We'll, uh, we'll have about uh, 15 more minutes of, uh, of informal uh, Q&A and discussion. Why don't you come over here on this side? All three of us? Please. Oh, okay. Questions? Well, I don't know. Statistically, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm willing to assume the House is undisciplined at almost any given point. Uh, it certainly is right now under its current leadership. But uh, the, uh, I don't know, in fact, it's rather disciplined under its current leadership. But yeah, I think I think what happened was that, that you got into a debate about supply side economics at that point, which is what the 81 bill was all about. And you had again this philosophy uh, that the more you cut taxes, the more the government gets money. Which I'm not, not. I'm not laughing at at all. I mean, there, there is actually a you know there's a there's a there's there's a, a case I suppose you could make for that, and how you statistically how you measure it becomes very difficult. I think what ultimately happened though, wh whatever the truth of that might may or may not have been, Bob Dole in particular, who was a more traditional sort of Republican then and now in some ways, was never a big supply side economics guy. He was more a kind of a common sense George Bush the first view of the economy. Yeah. Remember, George Bush the first dismissed Reaganomics as voodoo economics. So, uh, 
uh, Bob Dole, who was the senior Republican then, they looked at the, the, the aftermath of that 81 tax bill and looked at more traditional, uh, if I could call it that, analyses of what that tax bill was doing to federal revenue collections in reference to the you know, budget deficit, even the national debt, because the government was having to fund, some, uh, fund those deficits, and said, oh, this isn't good. And uh, so you had beginning, uh, I don't think it kicked in until 83, but you had fairly quickly, ironically, fairly quickly upon the adoption of the 81 Reagan Tax Act, Congress turning, in part under the instigation of the Senate and Bob Dole, turning to the question of trying to figure out how to raise taxes and offset some of this and do it in ways that were not overtly challenging to the degree possible, overtly challenging or insulting to President Reagan, or certainly in ways that would cause him to sort of have to say, geez, you know, we can't, you know, I can't possibly tolerate that. You may recall at the time there were, that you started to hear the phrase, the cement cracking around Reagan's feet. I don't know if you ever saw that. It was specifically in reference to his quiet but increasing willingness under the admonition of traditionalists like Bob Dole to, to consider signing bills that actually, in fact, were tax increases. They called them revenue enhancement bills and things. And the press started to call that cement cracking. And there were, there were two or three of those that didn't entirely offset the 81 Act by any, any stretch, but did, did, in effect, claw back or take back a reasonable portion of, of the tax cut that was in that bill. No, I, I no, I did. No, no, the answer is no. Not to the Dick Darman was who later became the head of OMB was Jim Baker's deputy at the Treasury at the time we were doing this. Had a lot of contact with him, and, and after he went to the OMB too, but not not with David. No, no, I didn't with David Stockman. No. Very bright guy, you know. I, that's all I can tell you. Was I think was well respected, a bright guy. He got himself in a little pickle there. Um, I think he was a little too frank at one point. Wasn't that the let me say and he sort of David's, revealed what the scheme was, didn't he, Lou? Yeah, David Stockman came out of the House, and I was amazed when he became OMB director, he'd be back at committee hearings, and instead of people <coughs> saying, Dave, you have no idea what you're talking about, you're flying blind, they believed him, they deferred to him. And when Stockman wrote his book, strange title, The Triumph of Politics, yeah. I mean, what is supposed to triumph other than politics? And he said on the 1981 uh, tax bill that he said to do what we did in 1981 required comprehension and we had none of it. He admitted he was just flying blind the whole time. He had no idea what he was doing. But the, the, the extent to which members believed him and bowed down to him was just stunning. He had no independent sense. And these were people on the budget committees and others that had been on the Hill for 20 years with more expertise than Stockman would ever know. But they still uh, they went along with it. Yeah. So the first question is, no one has a comprehension of magnitudes like that. And uh, I guess you can do some kind of a game with your students of how many pennies or dollars it would take to go up to the moon or whatever it is. But no one, no one knows once we get up to figures like that about the magnitude. Tax business, Larry? Well, it's all in the eye of the beholder, I suppose, in terms of whether something's more rational than what you have. I, I think in Europe, people sometimes, uh, point to Europe where they have a value added tax, which is in effect, in, in sort of a net effect, the national sales tax, and sort of diminish the, uh, the, the relevance of the income tax. Although several European countries have income taxes, they're, they're sort of, in, in some, culturally, in some of these countries, it's kind of a game just to ignore them, uh, or just work out a number with the tax authorities and you pay some, some agreed amount of money. 
uh, and the tax administration on the income tax side, even in those countries where they have them, is not, ours may be a little shoddy, but theirs is almost non-existent. So what they rely on in the main is they have, they have estate taxes. They do, do have taxes on, on the states and what have you. But they have, they have built into their economic stream, their economic system, uh, what amounts to, they call it value-added taxes, but it you know, amounts to a sales tax and impossible to avoid. Uh, it's, it's built right into the price of goods and services as they cascade through the economic system and collect it at various points. And, and very powerful rev revenue sources. These are socialist economies in many cases that in relative terms are collecting a considerable amount uh, greater in taxes th than, than the American system is, actually, because they're funding you know, national health care systems, for example. And they managed to do it without creating civil riots and what have you through this through this value added tax. So that's a I mean it has I mean it can be a, a very significant revenue engine. But whether it's preferable or better, it's a, it's a little it's a little less obvious in some ways. I mean you're not in terms of form filling and what have you from a from a kind of a consumer at the retail level, it's a little less irksome perhaps because you're not you're not tied up quite to the same degree as you are under our system filing. In some cases, enormously complicated forms on April 15th, and et cetera, et cetera. They, they do tend to avoid some of that. And are, are, are you uh, also asking not only about the numbers, but about, I don't know whether it's, are you asking not only about the numbers, but also about kind of how you present the process in terms, or, or the fact that we have a wide variety of ways we get taxes? Well, sometimes what I do in thinking about the federal budget process with students is to really try to go through the process and what comes first, first the budget resolution and how that gets done, including the politics of it, and, uh, and then through the various appropriations bills and how we, in fact, got, why we, initially why we got a budget office and so forth. And, that, to some degree, seems to at least give them a basis, then, for understanding some of the other aspects of budgeting. I don't know whether that's a help, but... Some, some people thought that the Reagan deficits would produce in, inflation interest rates declines, which it did not happen. Um, when Reagan came into office, the national debt from 1789 to 1981 was $1 trillion. Uh, by the time Bush won left, it was around $5 billion. Um, I, I made the mistake of thinking the Republican Party was against deficit financing. It turned out that uh, it was never a value at all, and it's not a value on the Democratic side either, although Clinton brought it down to a place where we had surpluses, which, Larry, I guess that was a mistake. Once you see surpluses, the doors open again well, for, for Alan, mischief. That's what Greenspan, yeah. not so helpfully, I thought, offered yep. as an observation, that, uh, that surpluses were a problem, potentially. The, uh, I, but it's interesting, anyway. Greenspan, who's supposed to be doing the monetary policy, is suddenly the guru on tax policy yeah. and budget policy and everything else. Now, I, I think it only becomes a problem if it starts to pressure interest rates, and, it can, and there can be a, a linkage made. And I guess the Fed will be the, uh, the declarative body there, whether they're right or wrong. The, the ultimately, the Green, they're, they're already making some noise about the deficits are going to have to be attended to at some point here, not in the too distant future. So all this sort of 
uh, obtuse you know, language, but I think economic theory would suggest, yes, at some point, you either have inflation, which they can't tolerate, you're going to have inflation, which they will not tolerate, or, or you're going to have to do something to, you know, sort of get these deficits on, in, in, in control. Yeah. Well, I think, I think the real problem is, is and, and again, I, th I think the actuaries are, the, the math associated with the actuarial judgments and stuff is compelling. When you look at the, the longer range forecasts on the Medicare program and the Social Security program and overlay, obviously, in, in, interpolate the demographics of the age, the age curve in the population, uh, people, the baby boomers, the, the infamous baby boomers you're talking about are going to start moving into those systems. You're looking at an enormous issue in terms of, of uh, financing cost. And uh, something's got to give somewhere. You have to raise more money, you're going to have to raise more money, or you're going to have to, yeah. Dr. Stevens, could you comment on uh, uh, Dr. Fagan's interview and how they're going to approach it as far as the Medicare program and Medicaid? I don't know much about that. I follow it but only, only through the newspapers, but in a technical way, I don't have a good fix on it. Anybody here with it? Faith-based? Churches, uh, the funds they're getting. Can I add one thing? Uh, Suki reminded me of it. Uh, I'm sure in class, students think about national interest and special interest. And I guess national interest is a good thing, and I guess that's what the president's for, and special interests are a bad thing, and that's what members of Congress are for. I just think it's extraordinarily superficial. There are a lot of national interests that are not too attractive. Uh, and a lot of special interests are perfectly attractive. And I thought one of the interesting things on Clinton, I mentioned on the Line Item Veto Act, he could go after uh, special tax benefits, a hundred or fewer. And he had about 70 opportunities to cancel those. And he did it, I think, two times. And the reporters were asking him, how could you have 70 opportunities? What's, what's a better definition of a special interest than these things? And Clinton said, and it's true, sometimes a special interest is in the national interest. Because a lot of those special interests didn't come out of Congress, they came out of the Treasury Department. And I think if we could look at them, we'd say, yeah, it's in the national interest. So this business that there's something wrong about a special interest and something great about a national interest uh, is a very mischievous kind of a concept. Well, I think, I think that some of that may come out of the fact that, that one tends to think of the president as a national representative, if you will, and members of Congress as having clearly more uh, smaller constituencies, but I, Lou is absolutely right. The, that doesn't therefore mean that, the, that presidential suggestions are always national in scope or in or, or, uh, national interests and that congressional uh, ones are really always special interests and I think that that's one of the things actually as teachers that we need to try to overcome in a lot is the, the cynicism in a sense towards Congress, I think, in particular, uh, because they do represent separate constituencies. Clearly, one of their jobs is to represent the interests of their constituencies, but it may not mean, not putting the national interest aside, they may, in fact, be very much the same. And there may be times when, in fact, they say, you may want this, but it's just not in the national interest, and therefore, I'm going to have to vote this way. And even if you talk about national interest for national security, as yeah, you did, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> where does that money go? It goes into yeah. districts, uh, yeah. into communities. That's true. Nothing national. Everything is not spent in the District of Columbia. Well, well some of it is. You can look <laughs> at the different kinds of bills. But, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we'll go to the tax of the 19th century, the tariff of abominations. Next door. Okay. Okay, thank you.